Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out. Washu was born in Illinois to Taiwanese parents, then moved to Texas and California. He went to Berkeley and got a degree in political science, and his PhD at Harvard in American Studies, or the History of American Civilizations, which is where we met. I was working on my PhD in English at the same time, and we shared a dissertation advisor that we were just gossiping about. I don't remember exactly when or how I met Wa, but I remember hanging out with the American Studies crew, getting drinks at the cellar, chatting in the Barker Rotunda. They were all super fun and funny, but in really different ways. Some of them were sardonic, some of them were goofy, boisterous. Wa, I always thought, was wry. That was the perfect word for his sense of humor and I love hanging out in his speech patterns. This crew was a little intimidating to me. They were all working on cool projects about microphone technology and jazz, about cockfights and the original you know, political figures who actually liked to make roosters battle each other, black architecture, and in Wa's case about both kind of over the top popular figures like Pearl Buck, and marginal figures like H.T. Tseng, a writer whose FBI file Wa discovered while in the archives at UCLA. Wa published his dissertation as a book with Harvard University Press in 2016. It's the floating Chinaman, right? Yeah. And got tenure at Vassar. He's now at Bard. Despite this formidable academic training, there's always been an openness as well as this kind of edge of sophistication in the way that Wa talked about art and culture with his friends. And what it always bespoke to me was a kind of discernment about aesthetic value that didn't quite map onto the usual norms of taste. I wouldn't have the courage to think about high culture and popular culture in this way and apply critical and political lenses to it for another decade or so. But Wa was always thinking in this way and writing in this way. I remember being really excited when I read his interview with uh, one member of the hip hop duo Das Racist, um, whose song I think he led me to, their most popular song. Do you guys know the song? I'm at the Pizza Hut. I'm at the Taco Bell, I'm at the combination Pizza Hut and Taco Bell, no? This is kind of a combination Pizza Hut Taco Bell deal tonight, um, so welcome. Um, Wa has been a staff writer at The New Yorker uh, for a few years. He started writing for them in 2014. He's written profiles and reviews of Bjork, Bell Hooks, Sandra O. Oh. He's written for Art Forum, The Atlantic, Slate, and his work has been anthologized in the best music writing and best African American essays. His essay on suburban Chinatowns was a finalist for a James Beard Award for food writing. But I remember an artifact of our earlier time together that speaks to how inspirational Wa's work and ethos has always been for me. And it was a mix CD that he gave me for my 25th birthday. It's a mix I downloaded to my Dell laptop and uploaded to my um, iPod, which I still have. And I called it my morning mix, even though I don't think that's what Wa called it, because it always lifts my spirits on days I don't want to wake up. It has some old favorites by Tribe Called Quest, um, but also kind of this interesting combination of covers of songs, of very famous songs like Mas Que Nada or uh, Feeling Good, which I know, and the Nina Simone version, uh, Tainted Love as well as Cat Power's cover of Oasis's Wonderwall, which is not on Cat Power's covers album, but is actually like another live performance. It has songs by artists I'd never heard of, and because of this kind of uploading to uploading and saving to things under just the title Morning Mix, I actually don't know the names of a lot of these artists, but I could probably sing that entire album to you. I've had it for over a decade. Wa's curation skills are out of this world because something about the way he puts these songs together also captures something about my spirit or something about the way I cover other artists in my own work, the way I engage with the classics, but also with the new. And I feel 
in a lot of ways to quote his amazing new book, Stay True, that that gift was a profound act of knowing. Wash you. Wow, that was, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, that was incredible, thank you. Um, thank you, Bernard, thank you for everyone for being here. Um, this, it's really cool to be able to do this. I, I don't know, the, the novelty of being able to read with the Molly will not wear off, at least for the next two hours, so. Um, but my, uh, yeah. So uh, thanks for being here. So I wrote this book, um, Stay True, and I'm gonna be reading mostly from it, but um, also from something else, which is sort of kind of adjacent to it. Um, but all you need to know is that uh, this takes place at Berkeley in the, the, the late 1990s. And it's primarily about a friend of mine named Ken. I have a photo of Ken and Susie sitting shoulder to shoulder in the back just as we're about to embark on a short road trip. They're chewing gum, smiling. I remember nothing else about the trip except the excitement of leaving for someplace else. Finals were over, and before we went our separate ways for summer, a bunch of us spent the night at, ha at a house a few hours away from Berkeley. In general, I wasn't used to seeing Ken in the back seat. We spent a lot of nights driving around Berkeley his leg propped up on the passenger side door, his eyes scanning the horizon for undiscovered coffee shops, some out of the way dive bar that would become our haunt once we turned 21. He was always overdressed, a collared shirt, a polo jacket, things I would never wear. But maybe it was just that he was already, he was ready for adventure. More often than not, a song's drive to 7-Eleven for cigarettes. At that age, time moves slow. You're eager for something to happen, passing time in parking lots, hands deep in your pockets, trying to figure out where to go next. Life happened elsewhere. It was simply a matter of finding a map that led there. Or maybe at that age, time moves fast. You're so desperate for action that you forget to remember things as they happen. A day felt like forever. A year was a geological era. The leap from sophomore to junior year of college suggested unprecedented new heights of poise and maturity. Back then, your emotions were always either very high or very low, unless you were bored and nobody in human history had ever been this bored before. We laughed so hard we thought we'd die. We drank so much we learned there was a thing called alcohol poison, poisoning. I always feared I had alcohol poisoning. We stayed up so late, possessed by delirium, that we came up with a theory of everything, only we forgot to write it down. We cycled through legendary infatuations sure to devastate us for the rest of our lives. For a while, you were convinced that you, were one day, that you would one day write the saddest story ever. Ken and I swapped theories, looking for stories that might make our world seem more real. We talked a lot about television. We'd been schooled to look for allegorical meaning, so of course we quested for alternative interpretations, unpacking all the tropes that governed our imaginations. We stretched our memories to come up with a list of every old TV show, every member of the 1984 San Diego Padres. There was no such thing as authority, just whoever could pull the randomest reference or narrate the most compelling take on some formative movie from our youth. In those days, I fixated on the lamest things people did. I didn't trust anybody who tucked their shirts in. When Ken tried to get me to listen to classic rock, or worse yet, Pearl Jam, I recoiled in disgust as though he were presenting a virus. When he told me about his plan to move to Boston after graduation, I admired his vision, far beyond San Diego. But Boston was lame. I wanted to go to New York. When he started reading philosophy and theory, I delved into even more obscure philosophy and theory. He recommended a book on hegemony and socialism by Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe. I scoffed as if he had just praised the Pearl Jam of post-Marxist thought. Oh yeah, I've heard of them. And then I committed their names to memory. He often wanted to talk to me about girls, an area of knowledge where my understanding was largely conceptual. All I'd ever learned about romance in high school was that Schindler's List is a terrible idea for a first date. We were also the only people in the theater uh, for matinee, which made it much worse. 
Um, it was an aspect of life I was still figuring out. Meanwhile, Ken unironically used words like libido. We were always being asked to read things for which we were unprepared. How can Foucault possibly make sense mere days into college? But you read anyway, confident that there would come a day when you could pull from Adorno or Hegel. For now, you underline the parts that sound as if they applied to your life, your perspective, whittling these systems of thinking down into something usable, like a sudden disdain for Nike. All of this would make sense soon, maybe when we were juniors. The present was a drag. We lived for the future. Youth is a pursuit of this small kind of immortality. You want to leave something behind, record a single and put it out in the world, the part of the world that never dies, granted new life in the used bins and secondhand shops. Nestle your zines and manifestos inside newspapers around campus, between the pages of magazines left behind in cafes, your words against theirs. Spray paint another's initials in the parking garage. You hurtle toward the future where you might look back upon the intricate secret handshake and laugh at how silly it once was, if you can remember it at all. We sought a modest kind of infamy. Ken and I used to study at a particular table in the library, in the interstitial zone between where various Asian fraternities and sororities flirted with one another. They had a different kind of pride. They claimed AZN pride, this will only make sense to Asian Americans from California, just like this kind of cheesy version of Asian pride that we thought was kind of lame. But they claimed this, and they were aliens to us. We would make each other keel over in laughter by miming lengthy, silent drum solos, sliding a bag of gummy bears back and forth like some slow, erratic game of air hockey. Above us was a plaque with a painting of an old white man. Beneath him were the names of everyone who'd earned whatever award was named in his honor. We'd write our names on slips of paper and sneak them into empty spaces underneath him, wondering how long it would take before someone noticed us. So um, this book is, is about, um, this book is about kind of the, the banal ecstasy of, of youth and just sort of how, you know, boredom is really the, cr the crucible for friendship when you're young. You're bored together, you're really trying to figure out some way out of your boredom together. And it's sort of in that process that you find the people who complete you but also complicate you. And in the course of writing the book, it's sort of what emerges is, is that I was, I think I am less so now, and Amali's generous introduction may, may convince you that I'm not a, a sort of like serious and elitist person, but that's very much who I was in college. And uh, when I befriended this person, Ken, um, I, was, I was very suspicious of him because he was mainstream, he was in this fraternity, he was confident, uh, he didn't have trouble um, speaking for himself. And these are all qualities that I found sort of anathema to who I wanted to be. I wanted to be around people who liked the exact same obscure things as I did. Um, and it was a friendship that, that really changed my life in part because it, it ended in 1998 when I was 21, uh, when Ken was, was killed the summer between our junior and senior years. And I started writing some of the sentences that would go into this book uh, the, the day after it happened in July, on July 20th, 1998. I didn't realize at the time that I was writing a book because I was 21. I had no dreams of becoming a writer. Writing a book seemed like an impossible thing, but writing was just a place to go. It was just a, a, an escape from the kind of relentless you know, sadness that a lot of us were feeling uh, after we had lost our friend. And um, so I'm going to read something that actually isn't in the book, but it's sort of adjacent to it. And it's sort of prompted by uh, an experience I had reading in the courtyard. Right at, when I realized that this was, that was here, not, uh, I, I remember that I had this um, very transformative moment reading a book uh, in the courtyard right outside here um, some 10 or 11 years ago. I mean, it reminded me of this, this other thing that I had written, which is actually also... <laughs> one long Instagram caption. Um, for years I was looking. I used to go out at night in search of what exactly? Other people's dreams and visions, their best efforts and one-off genius accidents, all attempts to make sense of things I was feeling but could not explain. I would go to the record stores and bookstores along Telegraph and then in Harvard Square, Central Square, and then in Brooklyn and Manhattan. The ones opened late. 
and dream of finding a piece of music or paperback that felt the way I felt, high and low, quiet and loud, busy and lazy, occasionally hyper, yet mostly bummed. I didn't read a ton of memoirs before writing this book. Whenever I read, I'm basically looking for things to copy, um, cadences, structures, gimmicks, and I could never find a, a book that I could imitate for whatever this book became which is possibly one reason why it took some 20 years to write and conceive of it as a book. But one night around 1998, I walked into Amoeba and picked up Jewels of Thought for $3. I knew nothing about Pharaoh Sanders beyond his cool name. I was drawn to the fonts, the colors, the peaceful repose struck by the man on the sleeve. It opens with the sound of clapping hands. Why not join in? It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard, flecked by occasional blasts of exorcism. It was a cosmos, not a song. Not music, but a model to be followed. A relationship I wanted to have with the world, and a possibility. Um, yeah, uh, the book is just sort of the thing that I was looking for when I would go out in search of things um, at night, and um, I hope you find it too. So thank you. Uh, I don't know how long that was, but uh, just all the more time for Q&A. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce Namwali now. Namwali Serpel is a decorated writer and scholar, an essayist, a professor of English at Harvard University, a rigorous yet limber thinker on scales intimate and continental. Someone is comfortable dissertating on matters of ethics and phenomenology as emojis and shade. I could spend my allotted time reading out the list of awards she's won. Hopefully a few will suffice. We're here to celebrate her wonderful, lauded new novel, The Furrows, published a couple months ago by Hogarth. She'll tell you more about it, but I'll say for me, and, and it's, it's really kind of trippy because our books are, you know, they overlap in, in these like fascinating ways. Um, but for me, it, it really captured the vivid like unreality of grief, whether one is mourning an individual or, or a way of life. Before The Furrows, her 2020 book, Stranger Faces, a collection of essays on faces, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and a Believer Book Award. Before that, she published the 2019 novel, The Old Drift, which won the Arthur C. Clarke Award for Science Fiction, the Annisfield Wolf Book Award, and earned her the 2020 Wyndham Campbell Prize. Before that, she won a Kane Prize for African Writing, she appeared in Best American Short Stories, and before that, she won a 2011 Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award. I had multiple tabs open on my computer, making sure I got everything. And then I suddenly remembered that she also found time to squeeze in Seven Modes of Uncertainty, an academic monograph, which took seriously what it means for literature to unsettle us in this, uh, or leave us in a state of disquiet, even as we consult it for ethical lessons. A reviewer in the journal Novel called it a bravura performance, uh, which is high praise for uh, an academic journal because it's legible praise. Uh, anyhow, I knew her before all of this. Uh, we overlapped as graduate students, as you now know. Um, I was a couple years ahead, which in grad school makes one seem wizened and experienced simply because you know the best bars and the best nights to go to them. And I'd like to think, for me personally, I feel this way that it's sort of like the people you know before who sort of, uh, you know, perhaps always recognize something. I'd like to think there's something about knowing someone from before they were so widely known, you know, this idea that you recognize that budding potential first. But I have to honestly admit that I didn't see it. <laughs> because Namwali was so much smarter than me, I could barely keep up with what she was saying, let alone fathom this horizon of achievements, this horizon where she currently lives. Her intelligence is just so dogged and so precise. Um, she, uh, I like uh, emailed a bunch of um, her colleagues to, for words of praise. Even though they're all like complaining about grading papers, they all took time to write these like beautiful essays about how wonderful Namali is, um, which I can tell you about more later. She would always locate the paradoxes and try to figure them out, find the seeming cul-de-sacs and attempt to map a way out. But best of all, and this is rare, like in graduate school you encounter a lot of people who are smarter than you, uh, but you don't encounter people who are also fun to hang out with, and Molly was all of these things. And I'm happy for her and proud, proud of her, and I think The Furrows is a spectacular achievement. In some ways, I find it 
it, it's an even more ambitious of a story to tell than the old drift, which is saying a lot given that that was a maximalist multi-generation epic. But this is a world in which I also found myself lost and then I found myself again. Um, and I hope you want to step into this world too, because like me, you won't be the same. Verklempt. I'm just going to read from the beginning of the novel, um, so you don't need any context. I don't want to tell you what happened. I want to tell you how it felt. When I was 12, my little brother drowned. He was seven. I was with him. I swam him to shore. His arms were wrapped around my neck from behind his chest on my back, his knees pummeling my thighs. At first, his small heavy head was on my shoulder and he breathed in my ear, the occasional snort when water came in. His head bounced, my shoulder ached. His hands were knotted at my collarbone and I held them there with my hand, both so that he wouldn't let go and so that he wouldn't choke me. With my other hand, I pushed the water away. We had gone to the beach for the day, just the two of us, alone together. This was allowed. This was our whole summer. Our family lived in Baltimore, or in the suburbs really, a place called Pikesville. When June came and set us free from school, and set my father free from his job teaching chemical engineering at Catonsville Community College, my mother was a painter, so she was always free. We would drive three hours down to Delaware to a town near Bethany Beach, where every year we rented the same narrow gray house with a skew porch out front. Every morning, after breakfast and cartoons, my brother and I would leave our father to edit his articles and our mother to dab at her paintings. Wayne and I would change into our still damp swimsuits, and I would pack us Capri Suns and Lunchables from the fridge. We would walk along the roads, cutting through a gap between the fancier houses to reach the beach. My mother had told us that the gap was called no man's land, which Wayne had misheard and took to mean it belonged to a man named Norman. We'd sneak quietly through Norman's land, then tromp over the boardwalk, our flip-flops knocking against it, and find our favorite spot on the shore, which was marked by clumps of seagrass. Wayne was a nutty brown, a scrawny creature, a good kid. He played so hard as if play were work. I was too old to play, so I watched him play and helped sometimes. That day, I buried him for fun's sake. We dug a shallow trench with cupped hands, like dogs, like gardeners. The top sand was cane sugar, the under sand brown sugar. When the trench was big enough, he tumbled into it, and I packed the sand onto his body, patting it over his hands and over his bony knees. Under the fluorescent sun, he lay as still as a magician's assistant. He asked me to cover his head with our straw hat, and I said, no, you'll suffocate. He flinched as if to grab for it himself, then remembered that his hand was buried. Too late, the mound of sand over it had sprouted a crack. He glanced at it, at me. I patted the sand back flat. After a moment, he said it again. He mouthed, cover my head. I touched my sandy finger to his sandy cheek. Close your eyes, Wayne, I said, and placed the straw hat over his squinching face. I had stolen that hat from a fruit vendor before Wayne was born, when he was still in the womb. Our mother, pregnant and craving, was buying a pear at a stand at a farmer's market. The hat was rolling at the fruit vendor's feet like tumbleweed. It beckoned me, and so I picked it up and put it behind my back, switching it quickly to my front when we turned to leave. My mother didn't notice until a block later. She twisted my earlobe till it stung and hissed, it's too late to give it back now, you little twit. Although our family had owned the straw hat for many years now, it was still too big for either of us kids to wear. We used it for carrying things instead, its leather chin strap serving as a handle. We had used it today to bring lunch and a towel. Now it swallowed Wayne's head completely. You're a dead Mexican, I giggled. Ole, he muffled from under the hat. I mean, cowboy, I said. Ahoy, he said. That's a sailor. There was a pause. Yeehaw, he said. I didn't answer, I didn't laugh. I walked away from his buried body, staggered off into the sand pockets toward the greenish sea, bored but deeply satisfied that he would be surprised to find me gone when he lifted that dumb hat off his face. 
my turn to trick him for once. My toes were already wet by the time he realized I was gone. He leapt up and tossed the hat and gangled his way toward me, yelling pell-mell, splumishing past me into the water. I watched his bronze back vanish, then retreated and sat beside the empty trench with my arms around my knees. There was no one else around. It was bright and hot, the end of summer. Then the clouds came and lowered. The wind rose, the waves rose. Dear Wayne, you swam into the furrows. At first you didn't know it because you were under the surface and you faced down as you swam, staring at the vault of the sea below. Then you felt the sky darken above you, a shadow passing. And when you came up to breathe, you were suddenly inside them, the great grooves in the water, the furrows. On either side of you, those whirring sheets of water, the foam along their edges sharpening like teeth. On either side of you, the furrows, cle cleaving, chewing, they ate you up. You were alone out there, and the world took you back in, reclaimed you into its endless folding. He was joyful and swimming, and then he wasn't. I ran in, I swam to him. I reached him and we grappled some until he managed to get on my back and wrap his arms around my neck. I held his knuckles in my hand. I turned and swam us to shore. He dragged me back. Halfway to the beach, his small heavy head began to beat against my shoulder in an unreasonable way. That was the word I thought, unreasonable, a word our father would say. I knew to hold my breath and dive through the waves like our mother had taught us, but what about Wayne? Did he remember to dive, to hold his breath? There was no breath in me to ask or remind him. The wind whipped. I clutched his knuckles like a junk of bones in one hand, pushed the water away with the other. We rocked, his knees bumping the back of me, his head knocking my shoulder in that unreasonable way. It made no sound, but they found bruises later. I felt him soften, and something inside him came into me then, came into me in little waves, more and more ripples until it was done and my insides felt full up, his body swept clean of him, mine filled to bursting. I swam like this, doubled, an empty sack on my back, my fingers raw with clutching. How are you doing? That's a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's always hard. It's like there's like three jokes in the whole novel, and I'm like, I, <laughs> I can't really read them without context. So I always have to read from the beginning. And it's supposed to make you feel horrible and sad, but that's not great for a public event. So I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really so grateful for your, your introduction and also to do this event with you. I really like the fact that we have these two books. They came out the same day, they're twins. And they're both very much about trying to capture that sense of being with another person and then losing them and trying to work your way around what that feels like and I don't know how to enact that on the page. I get asked a lot about whether this writing this book was like difficult for me and I, I can't fathom how difficult it must be to write a book that's so much closer to the reality. I mean, my book's a novel, your book's a memoir. So I'm curious Wait, about- Wait, how do you answer that question first? I, 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 <laughs> I rant about how not all fiction is autofiction. And, um, and I, I do talk about the way that the loss of my sister when I was a teenager um, helped me, you know, conceive of the book in the sense that I wanted to write about how grief felt, mm -hmm. um, but I'm very eager to sort of separate out the two things. And when I wrote an essay about my late sister and when I've, I've written about my late mother, they're very, those felt, felt like very different experiences emotionally than writing a work of fiction. Like in what way? Like, like cathartic or? Cathartic isn't quite the right word. I, I, I mean, except like, yeah, they, it made me cry. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, it was very emotional in both cases. But it's like writing an elegy for a person that right. actually existed in your life, it's a different kind of gift, right? Whereas the novel is not, you know, in, 
is not quite the same kind of act. But are you accessing the same kinds of emotions? Like, could you, you know, because sort of like the, you could cry while writing about yeah. someone who lived, but can you kind of go there with a fictional character? I feel like I feel like I'm having like a you know like a a deja vu almost or like a where I'm, I'm we had this exact same conversation. No, no, it's like <laughs> it's like it's like when something's on the tip of your tongue, but it's a memory, and it's oh yes, okay. So in revising the old drift, I read my work out loud to revise, and I was reading a passage um, about one of my characters, and I got emotional. And I was like, whoa, that's good. That, <laughs> that, that bodes well. But, Nailed it. But <laughs> like at this volume, or are you like whispering to yourself? I, I always oh, read I to myself. Library. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. But like you'll read it at this, at this volume. No, no, no. Because I was in a, I, I, I kind of whisper it to myself. Oh, like, interesting. Yeah, yeah. But at that, that particular time, I was in a, like a library at a, in a writing retreat kind of space. So I was there were like people around enough that I didn't want to um, be loud, but yeah, no. But with this, with the furrows, I didn't have that experience. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's th to me, these things don't correspond exactly, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. But I, I imagine in going back to some of this, it, was it emotional? Yeah, no, it was super emotional. Um... Yeah, no, it was very, it was, it, like I said before, I mean, um, you know, my friend was, was killed in July 98, and mm -hmm. I started writing immediately afterward just because it was the only way that I could kind of cope. And then I delivered the eulogy at the end of the week, uh, mostly because I was the only one writing stuff down, so everyone's like, you should do this because mm -hmm. you, you, you're clearly already thinking about how to put language to this. And I remember I was talking to someone about this recently, and being at the funeral was like being, uh, it was like being at a rave. It was like being on drugs because mm. we were so high and so low at the same time because mm. there were just so many people kind of crushed together in this room, and we were all kind of there for the same reason. Mm. And it was like because we were extremely in love with this person and we were all extremely sad at the same time. Mm. And I remember walking off the podium or whatever it's called at a funeral home and thinking whatever that was, that, I don't know if that was good writing, but it was like perfect. That's exactly mm. what I wanted to express in that moment. And then that became something that I, I chased for quite a while, I think mm -hmm. as a writer, even, even stuff that, I mean, I, I've worked as a journalist None of this is like in any of my other work, but it's always mm -hmm. kind of in the background. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was, it was very, I don't know. But then, but now that I've turned myself into a character, um, yeah. it's very strange to then have other people have emotional responses mm -hmm. and, and sort of displace mine in some ways. Yeah, I, I feel I, there's a couple of things that are resonant in that. My, my sister died in July 99 and the funeral did not feel like a rave because it was in a church and my sister wasn't Christian. And it was a very awkward, I think, fit. Um, but I was asked to, to read f something about her or for her, but I read from someone else's work. I read from Ntozake Shichange's uh, For Colored Girls. Mm -hmm. And I read this, uh, it's like the Red Woman speech and she's like, sex worker it's like it's very very um, intense thing to read in a church and but everyone who knew my sister when I read them the passage were like that's it that's perfect that's exactly it right there's some way that like words can sometimes just fit the feeling of what a person like their vibe or their aura or yeah. their soul right um, so I, I had that same feeling but it wasn't something I wrote so I wasn't hunting it down um, in that sense but I was going to say the feeling of um, turning someone into a character or turning something into a character and then people's responses. When I did write an essay about my sister, which is called Beauty Tips for My Dead Sister, um, I wrote it and I had this very emotional response to it. And then it got published like months later. 
And I got all of these messages and emails and calls from people who were having the experience of like thinking about her again. And were like people who knew her. Yeah, and yeah. who were reacting in that yeah. same kind of emotional way. I mean, have you had people like you? You, t you I love how you sort of drop um, people's names in the piece. Just like it's like the book is crowded with these friends. You know, <laughs> um, you don't always describe them. Sometimes you do, and sometimes you don't. But have you heard from those people? Yeah, I mean, I'm friends. I'm still friends with ninety percent of the people yeah. in the book. Um, you know, it takes place basically like first year of college to, I mean, just four years of college basically. And so everyone, I'm still friends with 90% of them yeah. and most of them were okay with their names being in it. Mm -hmm. The only people who weren't are people who still harbor dreams of running for public office. Right. Or something, <laughs> which is like kind of, kind of weird. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, and it, it's, it's actually been really beautiful because they were the only like I wrote it for myself, but they were the other people I kind of cared about. Yeah. And um, it's been kind of incredible to have this opportunity to just kind of have these conversations with my friends. We've never stopped talking to each other, but as we've grown older, we've, we've talked about him less, yeah. even though we've all kind of brought him with us in some way. And so yeah. it's been really incredible to, to have that opportunity. And, you know, I feel like if sometimes they'll be at readings and then I'll just yeah. read the parts about my friends. And oh, it's been, um, I don't know, it's been, it, it feels like a group effort in a way, yeah. at least I hope they see it that way. Um, I'm curious when you wrote about your sister, did your yeah. relationship to her or like, did it change how you thought about her or imagined her or visualized her? That's a really good question. I mean, I. I wrote it 20 years after she died, and um, it's you know it's beauty tips that she actually gave me. She was, she's the reason I live in New York now. She came to NYU in the late 90s, and I visited her as a young teenager myself. And it was downtown in the 90s. It was like this is amazing, um, <laughs> and I remember like you know wandering around Chinatown with her, and she was working as a model. She was very into fashion and that sort of thing as well. And she, you know, since I was 12 or 13, oh, this is how to pluck your eyebrows, and this is how to put mascara on, and this is how you should stand for photographs, and this is, you know, this was just like part of the way sisters <laughs> engage with each other. And I realized at a certain point that every time I put mascara on, her words were like in mm. my head. Mm. And so she was in this, she was with me every day in this, in this very, like verbal way, um, but also in this very bodily way, like every every day, and even like how I walk in high heels, like any anything. So I I thought you know this it was a way of registering a very small daily ritual form of elegy that I had been performing since the day she died, and in that way it made me realize how much she was still with me. Mm -hmm. um, it also, I think, one of the things that it helped me understand was something in her character that like rides the line between, um, you know, when you say someone's shameless, it's also a way of saying they're shameful, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but like she just had no shame at all. And there's something really amazing to me about having spent that much time with someone who just didn't have that, that wasn't part of her deal. Um, and it actually reminds me a little bit of the confidence you talk about Ken having. Like even though he was a complicated person who had you know, moments of doubt and all of that, but there's something about someone who moves through the world with a kind of grace almost yeah. that is very special. Yeah, and I feel like that's, I'm still susceptible to it in my 40s, but I think when you're a teenager, when you're growing up around someone, you know, they're the, the lessons, like the articulated lessons, but there's also just studying how someone stands or studying how someone sits mm -hmm. or how they speak. And, and it just sort of, you know, you're, you're learning about style, you're learning mm -hmm. about presence, you're learning about how to be and move in the world. And 
that's something I don't think I appreciated when I was younger because like I had such a fixed sense of what I thought was cool. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but it, was, it became very complicated once I realized that there are other ways of expressing yourself other than just the songs you like or, or yeah. um, how old your vintage clothes are. <laughs> <laughs> the vintage clothes thing in your book really <laughs> made me crack up so much. He, he, while talks about wearing like flowered shirts and cardigans and nearly audible corduroy, which is yeah. like an amazing <laughs> line. <laughs> <laughs> but it also, you say you basically like were dressed like an old man. And I was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I was, uh, and I, I, I did, yeah, no, I mean, I would wear, I would buy like kind of shoes that like, like my grandfather would wear, but then I didn't know that there were different sizes of shoes yeah. necessarily. <laughs> so one day I had, I bought these like incredible kind of orthopedic looking loafers and then I wore them home and then my roommate's like, those are way too big for you. Yeah. Like, oh, man. Like, I thought, I thought I finally had figured out how to be cool. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I'd alluded to this, um, and there will be questions. There will oh, be time yeah. for other yeah, people to we'll ask questions. Point, but yeah. um, <laughs> but I'd alluded to this, but you know, you you take on so many like such a range of topics and such mm -hmm. a different such a range of registers. Like, how do you kind of balance or manage or approach that as a writer? Like, I mean, I got it from you. Ask yourself. <laughs> No, I mean, but it's like, seriously, like, you know, while I was in graduate school, I was, my dissertation is just a sort of canonical list of mostly men. You know, it's like Henry James, Thomas Pynchon, Nabokov, um, Ian McEwan, and actually, I, I think Ian McEwan didn't come until the, the book version. I think I stopped in um, with Beloved, with Morrison, and, you know, Whereas, like, in American studies, you guys were studying all kinds of, like, interesting things. I didn't, you know, I didn't actually know you could study pop culture. nobody, we had no mentorship. No, we it's just true. sort of allowed it's to, just given a box of toys and allowed to play, so. But it's, but I think having the ability to apply the close reading skills and all of that, and even the critical uh, reading, you talk about, you know, uh, taking classes in the rhetoric department at, yeah. At Berkeley and like you know Foucault and Derrida and and all that and and but then like you're applying it to you know uh, what's the name of that film that you talk talk about the one the last the, dragon yeah the yeah. last yeah. Dragon. Barry Gordy's the last dragon which I've never seen I'm so movie. excited to yeah. see it but you know you and Ken are like watching it late at night and it's this kind of <laughs> kitschy movie it's black exploitation yeah. essentially but you're using some of the stuff you're learning in those you know those classes to to pull it apart and. I think for me, it's what it comes down to is noticing things. Mm -hmm. And you, the, that word actually appears a lot because you and Ken have this thing where he's like, you want people to notice that you know, you're know you not <laughs> into the things that you're, you know, and- You want people to hear the amount of corduroy you're right, wearing. Right, you know, like. <laughs> but this, But notice is not just something that like is a battle of cultural capital or, or coolness, right, yeah. it's also, a skill that can be applied to anything, like any any work of art that opens itself out to you to be noticed in some fashion. I feel like, and figuring out like exactly how to see it for what it's trying to do, but also to see what maybe is troubling about it. I think that's a really important capacity that we might actually be losing a bit of sight of um, because we're in such a moment of our responses to art are thumbs up or thumbs down. Right as opposed to like, well, what is it before we say if it's good, <laughs> right? Um, so I think holding on to that quality of open-mindedness about these different things. I mean, something you trace in the book so beautifully is this movement, as you say, from this like high righteousness and rigidity of an aesthetic hierarchy that we have as teenagers, like, Pearl Jam is like definitely not cool and <laughs> um, to this, you know, and you're like, and then I like listened to, you know, um, jungle music. And so I started going to raves and then I listened to just the way that the music kind of opens out, it, you kind of signal it in this, in the way it's the different kinds of songs. And the piece you just read about Pharaoh Sanders is beautiful in the same way. It's like this opening out to possibility um, that, to me has always struck me as the most important thing if you're going to 
work with or think about culture or try to make it is to be open to all of the different places where it might find you. How do you, as, you know, because I find people who can write fiction to be like, as I was saying, like, <laughs> you're like wizards to me, just that you can actually create this world. Like, how do you then decide how, where to kind of apply your discernment, you know, or kind of... With fiction? Oh, or just like, am question. I going to think about this in my fiction? Am I going to think about it in an essay? Am I, like, yeah. is that just me as a nonfiction person thinking that that's how. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I kind of wish it were like that because then it would, I would, it would seem like I was in more control. I had more choice about uh -huh. it. But um, I've never actually had a, an idea as a critic that I've been like, let me write a novel about it or vice versa. They, hmm. And all of my ideas about fiction come in their own little basket. So it's like, it's gonna go in this novel and this novel. I have like six novels in my head basically now. Maybe five now that I've published two <laughs> and gained one. But they're all completely different. I, but I think Wait, how, how, how fleshed out are these six other novels? They're, they, they, so they have, I think of them as like plots of, of land, okay. right? And then I'm sort of, and so I kind of have like the outline and I have like, and then I'm gardening them. Huh. And so I'm growing them. So what grows from them? might look different from when you just look at the land, but I have a lay of the land in all, for all of them. Okay, I find this, I find this fascinating. <laughs> so you have these, you know, because I'm, I'm very much like a deadline, like I'm a deadline person, so I'm, I, I don't have plots of land. I have like a list of a quota I have to fill. Right. Um, so you have like these five different like plots of land. Like how, yeah. where do they exist? Is it like a, a document? Like a multiple, notebook? Multiple documents on my phone, okay. um, in my email draft. And then you just kind of go to them when you feel like, like this. Yeah, I'll see a this thing land and I'm like, oh this, me. oh, this goes in, okay. in the movie about you know the airplane, or this movie, this one goes in the. Did I say movie? Well, you have movies too? No, I meant. I'm, <laughs> it's funny though. We're breaking that news one, tonight. That one seems to be the most filmic, but no. Okay. Uh, it's a novel. Um, or like, like recently, so for example, I have a novel that I started when I graduated from college. So I started The Old Drift in college. I started The Furrows right after grad school, the last year of grad school. Okay. This novel I started when I was living in Tacoma Park, Maryland with my family and working at a bookstore that was slowly transforming into a toy, a toy store, which is much less cool. Like, you know, you're like, I'm working at a bookstore and I'm a writer. And it's like, now it's a big now, shop. Now it's like, probably, <laughs> in Tacoma Park, probably. Um, and I started writing this novel that was probably kind of influenced by the corrections okay. and by white noise. So sort of family drama, um, suburban, and it's called Seed. And, uh, and recently, for whatever reason, probably because I'm procrastinating on a different novel I'm supposed to be working on, I've been like obsessed with this one. And I just read or reread um, Plato's Symposium to teach. And there's this amazing, like the conceit of the symposium is like it's a bunch of queer dudes hanging out, getting wasted, and talking about sex. Literally, great, this is like the great summary, work of philosophy, but this summary, is what yeah. it is. And I was like, I want to, I want to like rewrite this. <laughs> I want to like rewrite it for the present moment or whatever. And I was like, oh, this goes in seed. Like I just knew exactly where it went, okay. if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's like, it, like whenever an idea comes, it just knows where to slot. And then I try to find the time to actually like work on the garden. That's fascinating. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I, love, I love hearing about how people um, kind of grow their ideas and sort of grow their, um, yeah, grow these plots of land. Well, how do, you, how do you conceive of ideas in terms of nonfiction projects or cultural I mean, I, I basically, this was the thing that was just kind of like in the back of my head. So, yeah. I, I would, but it didn't really seem feasible as a book because it was just kind of relentlessly sad for many years. Yeah. And it wasn't until I realized that it could be funny or mm -hmm. it had to have life in it too um, that, that it became more of a, a book. But this was like really the only thing that I, I would work on other than things that someone had told me to do. Like I'm very- You work on assignments. Yeah, I work on assignment. And so if someone says like, write about this, mm -hmm. if, if usually I'll just do it. and. I like taking on a range of assignments. Like I like writing about like anything basically. So yeah. 
that's my version of it maybe, where yeah. I'll think about like, well, I'm, I'm working on this profile right now, so like, what's a cool scene to, to open the profile with? Yeah, like yeah. I'm writing a critic's piece about the photographer, like how am I gonna open the piece? But these aren't really, Plots of land. These are more just like, well, like this little tile right here. Well, it's the you know, tools. So. <laughs> it's the t I mean, but it's like it's the gardening tools. You're yeah. like, I'm gonna I'm gonna use the spade for this one, yeah. <laughs> and the rake for that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it is, you know, it is this interesting question. I always, you know, like of of kind of like finding the right form, finding yeah. the right register to to pursue something that, like a, a curiosity. Like for my for me as a critic, I'm always just interested in what it feels like to be alive. You know, mm. like what is it? What is the, What are the conditions of life in 2022? Like, what are things about life right now that interest me? Yeah. I just now have to find like an album that allows me to talk about that, you know, <laughs> or I need to find yeah, a book yeah. that allows me to riff on that. Um, so I guess that would be. I just have like this set of questions that I'm trying to, to look, locate in things that I can then pitch. But, yeah, yeah. Um, no, but know. that that makes sense. Like finding, it's like finding the. The, the work that's going to illuminate the set of questions. Yeah. Okay, I have one more question for you. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, and then we will open it up. Oh, I don't yeah, know yeah. what time it is. It's 8.34, so we have time. Okay. Yeah. Um, you are also a wonderful teacher. Oh, I have all of these you. testimonies <laughs> from your colleagues. I, that, feel, um, I didn't know that, that you were going to do that. Yeah. I would have I called all our friends. <laughs> um, I almost went on Twitter and was just like, can any Harvard undergraduates who take But um, <laughs> I thought that could get weird. Um, what do you, is there, uh, do writing and teaching interface or, or sort of mm. for you? Something I've realized recently, not with the fiction, um, probably to my students' relief, I'm not writing about their lives, um, <laughs> but with essays, um, a lot of the ideas that I end up writing about like emerge in conversation when I'm teaching things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, when I, like, I have a piece right now that I'm thinking about, and actually, I was thinking about it in relation to your book because I, I, I taught a course last semester on Roland Bart, and um, I discovered this very weird kind of, I don't even know how to, call, what, how to describe it. It's this kind of dialogue over the course of decades between Bart and Derrida, mm -hmm about an Edgar Allan Poe story oh, wow. in which a man is suspended right at the point before death and, and can still speak. And one of the things that the man suspended at the point of death says is, I am dead. And so Bart gives a paper and says, the, the phrase, I am dead, doesn't make sense. It's not utterable. Like, who can say that, possibly? And Derrida, in the Q&A, is like, actually, there's this Edgar Allan Poe story <laughs> where someone says, I am dead. And of course, for Derrida, it's like, to, to be able to- What an incredible moment. It's, it's so know? good. It's like, and, and then- The ultimate actually. Exactly, and, and Derrida is like the youngest person at the conference. He gives his paper the last day. This is the first thing he says at the conference in response to a, a paper that this very, wow. you know, so then, a few years later, Bart writes an essay about this story. Called, it, the story is called like the about death the of- About the Poe story. About the Poe okay. story. It's called the death of like Mr. Voldemort, I think actually, um, funnily enough. I don't know if Rowling was thinking about that, but, um, and in that story analyzes this moment where he says, I am dead. And then Derrida, writing after Bart has died, in his like eulogy, br says, someone just sent me this essay that Bart wrote about this Poe story, and it's curiously relevant to what I'm thinking about, which is how do we think about death? And he quotes the Bart essay, but skips the part where Bart quotes Derrida. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so, which is really weird because it's like you're you're like you're saying, isn't this interesting that my friend that I care so much about, who I'm eulogizing right now, wrote about this thing that I informed him about yeah. like decades ago? But then you skip the part where that friend actually acknowledged that 
right? It's a very strange thing. Anyway, sorry. This is, I'm obviously still in the early stages of writing this essay. <laughs> um, but you have this, this um, quote, and I, I was going to ask you about this. Um, you, you're writing about Derrida, writing about modern life. So you say, modern life, theorists like Derrida explain, is full of atomized individuals casting about for a center and questioning the, questioning the engine of their lives. His writing is famously intricate, full of citations and abstruse terminology. Things are always already happening. But reflecting on his own relationships tended to give his thinking and writing a kind of desperate clarity. The intimacy of friendship, he wrote, lies in the sensation of recognizing oneself in the eyes of another. We continue to know our friend, even after they are no longer present to look back at us. And I wanted to ask, I mean, first of all, like, I, I, I was like, I really, that's a beautiful way of describing how even when Derrida's being completely convoluted, you yeah. can still feel <laughs> what he's saying, and yeah. you can still kind of grasp the, the longing, in a way, behind what he's writing about. But I also wanted to ask these interpolations of like the theory of the friend from mm -hmm. Aristotle, or the theory of friendship from Derrida here, and, and, and also um, our departed friends. How did that come into the writing of the book, and when? I think a lot of, um, like I, I joked earlier about how a lot of my style was just like derivative of, you know, like, you know, I think so much of writing is just mimicking people you like. I believe and, that And too. trying to figure yeah. out like, this works for me, this doesn't work for me. And so I think, and, and for quite a while, I was just searching for templates, mm -hmm. for things to copy, for um, structures mm -hmm. mainly, when, when in reality, like what I was searching for was sensations and feelings like mm -hmm. Pharaoh Sanders or Maxine Hong King. Like I wanted to uh, capture these feelings and mm -hmm. not necessarily like the way, it's like the first line of your book, you know, just that mm -hmm. it's not me telling the story, it's like I want to tell you how this feels, you know. Yeah. And, and so I would read all of these theories around friendship because yeah. I thought that it was, it was a very kind of grad student thing to do. Mm -hmm. Like in order to, to write the sentence, you read like four books totally. to then cite yeah. someone saying something very simple like capitalism is troubling or something, you know. Sure, yeah. But, um, <laughs> but in this case, you know, like the Derrida politics of friendship, yeah. it's very, I still don't quite understand it, Me I think. Neither. But then he has all of these actual eulogies he gave. Yeah. He has all these letters and they're so clear yeah. and they're so quotable. And so I think it was, it, part of it came out of this desire to just like find these larger structures to kind of hang these thoughts on. Yeah. But um, it's also kind of like, at that point in the book, I'm still like very much in love with uh, my own sense of like esoteric knowledge. Sure. So of course, yeah. Like a 19 year old version of me would like quote Derrida just right. to be like, friends are cool, <laughs> yeah. you know, like friends rule, yeah. uh, as Derrida would say. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so it, it has that effect, but it's yeah. also because I think that what he, Derrida says about uh, the desire to see as well as be seen, like yeah. these, are, these are like perfect distillations of like what I was feeling at the time too. So, yeah. um, Sorry, I took us totally off track. No, cool. I was saying that I... Wait, so you're teaching the Poe? No, I learned about okay. this while I was teaching Bart because he has a book um, about mourning his mother. Mm -hmm. And um, he also, in his book on photography, is talking a lot about mourning. And so we were reading all of Bart, as much of, or as much of Bart as I could get grad students to read in a semester. And while I was like researching this, I discovered this like weird loop with, with Derrida. And I've, I was like, oh, I want to write about that. And so that often happens with teaching where, um, um, or like I have this essay about Sun Ra and about Ming Smith's photograph of mm -hmm. Sun Ra. And that came out of a lecture that I gave about Sun Ra in my black science fiction class. Cool. I hadn't actually seen Space as the Place before I taught that class. I often put on my syllabus things I want to see or or read. Yeah, same here. Yeah. I did that with Gravity's Rainbow, which was not the best idea. <laughs> I, did that, I did that with David Simon's book um, about uh, homicide. Homicide, Life in the Streets. Yeah, I taught a course on literature and evil, but it actually wasn't that. It was the other one. What's the, what's the Helter Skelter? Okay. Never, ever assigned that in a class. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> that was a terrible idea. <laughs> 
But generally speaking, you know, um, you know, something like preparing this lecture on Space as a Place and listening to Sun Ra's lectures that he gave at Berkeley yeah. and learning more about you know, him and like his weird philosophy, I suddenly got really, really obsessed and interested in it. And that was, that's like a path into a whole sideline of my career now is thinking about Afrofuturism. So yeah, so teaching definitely, I think, works in that way. Um, I don't know if I would say, I mean, it's like a lot of it is just, as you know, balancing the time between the two because yeah. it's hard to, to you know, um, find time to be on deadline when you're also teaching on a fixed schedule. But, yeah, that is the, that is the, the eternal struggle of, yeah. of time. Yeah. Um, but um, we should definitely yeah, invite others. Up, yeah. uh, thanks for yeah. indulging us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone has any questions, you know, you can just, yeah, right here in the front. I have a question. I was going to ask about how your teaching informs your writing or your writing informs your teaching, but you basically answered that already. So uh, as a teacher myself, I'm wondering if, if you feel like students have kind of changed over the last 10 or 20 years in your teaching, and uh, I mean, I feel they have, but the pandemic is probably a bad like, I feel like I can't grade as harshly as I used to. I mean, I wasn't a harsh grader, but <laughs> I feel bad for students more now, and I feel mm -hmm. like it's grading phase, I just do it, you know, it's like I'm conflicted. But I'm wondering if you feel like over the past decade or 15, 20 years, how students, young people, It's a huge question that I think about a lot. Um, yeah, I, I teach at a liberal arts college. I have no problem with great inflation because it's sort of impossible to be the one kind of... Uh, Hold out. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also find that, um, I mean, for me personally, it's, it's a privilege to just be around a fresh crop of young people. And it's like, it's literally like a Matthew McConaughey quote from Days and Confused that <laughs> I get older and they stay the same age. But in this case, what I mean is you're, you're just sort of engaging with a fresh set of possibilities, but also a fresh set of anxieties, right? Mm. And so I think I was drawn to teaching because I wanted to teach people who are just like me, you know, or like I, I remember being transformed by my professors in college, but in the 1990s, we didn't have, we didn't enter into as large of a world when we were 14. Like you go to college to learn about all of these things that you can kind of access now on the internet. So I think when I started teaching in 2007, I thought, you know what, I'm gonna tell you about the Chinese Exclusion Act and I'm gonna blow your mind because that happened to me in 1996, but that's not what, that's not the function of a college classroom anymore, I would say. And so I think I've become more sympathetic you mean, to- You mean they already know about it? Yeah, uh, they may know about it, but if they don't, it's not because this knowledge has been denied to them in quite the same I way. Yeah. And so I think I've become much more sympathetic to a lot of the, the anxieties that my students have, or just sort of the world that they're entering into is very different from the world that I entered into. Um, and I'm trying to meet them more where they are which, which is a challenge because I think students expect a lot more from institutions. Uh, I'll just, the last thing I'll say is like when, when Ken was, was, when Ken, after he was gone, we all just went back to school because mm -hmm. this was 1998. There was no, mm -hmm. institutions just didn't um, watch over you as much as I think institutions do now. And I think that also has the effect of creating higher expectations for institutions on the side of the student. But, you know, we didn't consult the school for our identity necessarily. And so mm -hmm. we didn't know that we should have gone to counseling or like taken the lighter course load or whatnot. We just kind of went back to school and that made sense in 1998. That wouldn't make sense now. But um, yeah, I don't know. You have this great line um, the thing you learn in college is how to live with other people. And I, I have to keep reminding myself that because I think otherwise I would feel very frustrated by all of the changes and all of the ways that we as professors and they as students have been asked to adapt 
to like a very brave new world kind of situation. Um, and just sort of keep it at the level of, if what you get out of sitting in this room with you know, 14 other young people talking about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is you learn how to yeah. you know, like have a conversation, then I've done my job. Because I, at this point, it feels like, it feels very difficult to know, as you say, like what they don't know, what has been not denied to them, what is or isn't available to them. The nature of knowledge and its authority is radically different when you go to your class and your professor knows more than you, as, as, as opposed to you go to your class, your professor knows more than you, but your phone knows more than your professor. Yeah. Right, and that wasn't we didn't. I mean, I love how you talk about email in this book because it's like, yeah, email. We used to like laugh at my dad, be like, oh, Papa doing his emails, yeah. you know. <laughs> like we didn't have this sense of uh, like knowledge is just everywhere, and you can get it from Twitter or Wikipedia or your professor. We had the sense that like the only way I'm going to learn anything is if I go to class and listen to this person. Um, so I think that already shifts. Uh, what what we think our role is, I I when it I, grade inflation I, I I don't believe in grades but I think this is my time at Berkeley I taught at Berkeley uh, after I graduated from Harvard um, for twelve years no more than that yeah twelve years and um, at a certain point you just start to feel like what are we doing here? Like, what, what, why, are we, why are we teaching our students about you know, ideology and the problem of institutions and the problem of hierarchies, but being like A, B, C, like it just doesn't, like what I was like, this just feels dumb. And so in my head, I would like, <laughs> I, I realized you can't say this out loud to them. I used to say, I, I tried once being like, you all have A's. And like, let's just go from here. And they just were like, okay, see you never. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, why would I come to class? Uh, but now in my head, I'm like, you all have A's. Like, don't worry, you know. And I try to reassure them that, you know, the way that I'm grading is, is separate from what I think is their learning process. Um, they're much better pedagogues than I am who actually walk students through this. They say, you know, what do you hope to get out of the semester? What do you hope to learn? I think I like things to be a little bit more fluid. You talk about a Berkeley lecturer straddling the lectern in an almost sexual way. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not quite that level of like <laughs> loosey goosey, but I like the idea of like a really open space. And I feel like in a time like now, I just, I feel like reciprocity is more important than obligation, if that makes sense. Uh, so much of our teaching is like, I teach you and so you give me a paper, but in, instead thinking of it as like a kind of gift in both directions, like yeah. you're giving me your thoughts, I'm giving you my thoughts, and let's see what comes of this. I feel like is a gentler way maybe to, to think about, um, about this process. A lot of this is the problem of institutions, as you say. It's like the whole like, oh, the students think they're customers, and so they're, they, they're disrespectful. It's like, well, that's not our fault. That's yeah. the fault of the institutions that are charging them out you know, so much money to come. So. I feel like we can't fix those problems um, because they're so big. So it's like I, I try to keep things as small as possible. Yeah. Hi, hey, Julian. Julian. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> Uh, I mean, for me, I, I was writing a lot for myself and just writing down inside jokes and, you know, just archiving stuff. But it was very much in the mode of being stuck in the past, I would say, which I think is very natural. Like, you're just sort of trying. You don't think about the, meaning, the, the meaningfulness of memories with your friends because you're just going to always create new ones that, that sort of, like, layer over. But once that narrative is, is like, terminated, 
then you, you begin to like periodize your memories or, or, or hold on to them in a more precious way. And so I think for many years, up until like, I think I was halfway through the book, I was very much just stuck with, in that one mode of like, this is a, this is like the saddest story I will ever tell or something. But then I realized that um, it was only sad, it would only be meaningful if someone actually understood how great of a person he was, you know, like how, how kind he was. And so that kind of, I think realizing that writing about joy and, and ecstasy and fun and goofing around and being kind of a dumb young person, like having fun and, and sort of laughing didn't diminish the ultimate tragedy of it all. And maybe that's very obvious for people who go through grief, but it's not something that I, I understood until I wrote those scenes. I realized like I've created this world that I can kind of hang out inside and it's, it's fun to hang out with us. I know what's gonna happen, but let's just hang out here for a moment mm -hmm. and have fun and just remember those things as well as um, kind of honoring what, what was going to be inevitable too. So I think when I figured out that it could be both of those things, like something that was funny but also sad, was when I realized like, I think I'm, I'm done with this. Or at least I've moved forward in a way that is, uh, creates more space for other people so that you're not just kind of coerced into feeling the way I feel because I'm feeling it so strongly. You know, like when people read it and say, I'm sad that this person died because he sounds like a great person, that's great because it shouldn't be about like me being overbearingly sad, if that makes sense, so. Um, I wish I knew <laughs> what my timing was. I mean, I think I can speak to, you know, writing the essay I wrote about my sister had a similar feeling of um, readiness to readiness to tell it in a way that's not going to be overwhelmed by the feeling or the history of the feeling. So there was like enough distance or enough mediation. And while it wasn't about tone necessarily, although I think that essay does have moments of humor more so than this novel does, um, it was about finding the form. I was like the right way to tell this to capture who my sister was is in the form of these beauty tips that are in her perspective and she's speaking to me, right? And so figuring out that form as the best way was when I chose to write it. I actually started writing it on the BART or on the way to campus one day. Oh, wow. Um, but um, in terms of the novels, it's, uh, it's like a, it's a conversation I have with like my friends who are editors, um, my agent, <laughs> my editors, um, and you know my readers, my my closest readers. In terms of um, like <coughs> because my trajectory is so off, it's non chronological. Like people keep being like, "This is your second novel," and I'm like, "Well, but I finished it before the first one." You know, so, and, I, and as you say, they're long gestating, and this one sort of sits in the middle of the gestation of that one. It's, 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 I don't have like a proper career trajectory, and so sometimes it's like, well, what novel would make sense to other people for me to write next? But at the end of the day, the choice of what to work on ends up being like what I, what I can, what I know I can immerse myself in and, and be interested in. Because I think of writing as a, I always quote Morrison saying, it's a slow and advanced form of reading. Mm -hmm. It's almost like I'm choosing which book to read next. <laughs> and so it, it has that quality of kind of, what do I feel like being immersed in, you know, for the next little while. And like I said, it also involves like procrastinating from other things, so. <laughs> what do I not feel like being immersed in? Thank you. 
First of all, I'm so sorry to, to hear about your losses. Um, and it's, it's, uh, and it's tremendous to hear that anything that I do, we do could, I mean, I, I guess it's like, for me, I wrote this for such purely personal reasons compared to the, re uh, the reasons I write other things, just because someone asked me to. And so it still kind of baffles and amazes me that people kind of feel anything about it because it was so kind of interior to me. Um, I, don't, I don't think about that responsibility or that possibility, but it's, it's very beautiful when it happens because I think it forces me to realize something about this book for me, which is that I feel as though I'm actually losing a bit of my own grasp of my friend Ken, mm. but that's because he's now like this character that enters into like other people's lives mm. and, and he won't be forgotten in that way. And I think that I've always tried to, and this is something my friends and I have talked about in the aftermath of it, because we talked about like ways in which that incident uh, changed the way we, we lived day to day. And I think we've all tried to move forward with him, you know, um, whether it's as a sort of like intellectual partner, like with like Barth and Derrida, or whether it's just thinking about these moments of, of kindness that we witnessed that we want to pay forward. It sounds so simple, and yet it's not something that I think many of us stop to think about, you know, the ways in which these incidental, like easily overlooked moments of, of love and kindness get passed on. And so, um, Does your book feel like your eulogy did? Does it feel like my eulogy did? Uh, it does. To me personally, it does, because um, it's, it's something that I was searching for for quite a while. And so, I, I definitely, uh, yeah, I have that same sensation. And so for it to actually, uh, you know, it's facilitated, like I've had so many conversations like this with people and it's mm. incredible to have, to be able to have that, that, that conversation and to um, kind of share in these moments as we all try and move forward and think about how we can bring what it was that mattered, you know, with us. Uh, I don't know if that answered, if that. Uh, I, I would echo that. And I, again, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear about your losses. I think, you know, I learned very recently that uh, this book is very indebted to Virginia Woolf. I think of it as like my modernist book. And um, it has a lot to do with, to the lighthouse in particular. And I just learned from a Woolf scholar that she has a diary entry where she says, um, this new project I'm working on, not sure it's a novel, not sure what I should call it, a, a blank by, the, the new blank by Virginia Woolf, elegy, question mark. And the subtitle of my book is an elegy, which I, I just had no, I'd had no idea that the two, um, that I didn't get that from her. I got that from my partner, actually. And that, the word elegy is a very interesting word when we think about like what it's for. Like who is it for? Who is an elegy for, right? Is it for the person who's writing to experience some kind of catharsis or, you know, as you were asking earlier, or, or to come to terms um, to, to, to remember? Is it for the dead? Is it a gift to the dead? Is it the only way that I can communicate to this person that's not there anymore is, is through this expression of feeling about who they were and how they were? Or is it for everybody, right? Like, is it a eulogy? Is it something you give to the community? And I think that ambiguity of address is really important for how we think about death because there's a very individualized, medicalized version of how we think about grief in this country. There's also one that focuses entirely on the dead. And then there's one that's much more, as you say, about you know, other people, the community. The institution against people, for example, the institution of God. Right, right. And it seems to me that you know, what, 
Wa was saying he got from thinking about Ken and from Ken himself in a sort of spirit of these small kindnesses. It it's, seems to me like the best we can do in how we talk about our individual griefs with each other is to kind of literally do what we're doing, sort of sit together with it. And I say this because there's a real impulse in humans to have a message or a solution or like something quantifiable or even extractable from the work of art or from the work of a conversation. But actually, it's, 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 I keep using this image. It's like two strings sitting next to each other, and one vibrates, and maybe this one vibrates a little too. It's the resonances, really, across disparate experiences that make us feel whole or that make us feel like we can withstand the grief. I think trying to, trying to tell someone like how to get over their death or how to get over you know, the, the grief in their life I, I, always fails, as far as I can tell. But sitting, setting our stories next to each other in some fashion, that feels, that feels closer to something like a comfort or a respite. So I mean, like, I'm, what I hope is that my novel does that with its characters, but I also hope that readers kind of thinking together about it or talking together about it can have that same effect. Um, and the conversations I've had, like this one and with other writers, have felt like that, where it's, uh, we're putting our stories next to each other and, and letting them sit. Ah. I mean, it, I wish I I wish I knew, but I also like I like that I don't know because. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, well, which is no, I, I I know I know when a novel is a novel, but I don't know why I know is what I'm saying. Um, I mean, it's 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 very it sounds like a, you know. I sound like a hippie, but I also sound like you know the Greeks. I'm like it just comes to me, you know? <laughs> and I think um, it's it, it really is like reading. It's like um, the feeling. The feeling is not a poem. The feeling is not a an essay or um, a short. Like I've I've thought uh, like I've written short stories before, and I've thought should I expand this short story into a novel? And it's it never. It doesn't work that way. Um, it, it's not even, it's, some people say they start a short story and they realize, oh, this actually wants to be a novel. Um, but it, yeah, they just kind of come. I mean, they, sometimes it's an idea, sometimes it's an image, sometimes it's a person, sometimes it's a voice. So it, it comes in different ways, but I mean, it's, it, I, again, I wish I could, I wish I could uh, explain it better, but people, your reaction of, of, of sort of curiosity about it, I have experienced, I have, we have a mutual friend, Julian Wa and I, Glenda, and I um, was, had, had surgery, and so they give me steroids, so it was, I was very high on steroids, <laughs> and we took a, uh, like a 10 minute walk to do errands in San Francisco, and during that 10 minutes, I told her, the plots of like five of these novels. And she was like, but like, you know everything that's gonna happen and who, and I was like, yeah, pretty, pretty much. It just, yeah. <laughs> so I wish I, I wish I could say more about it. But honestly, if I knew more about it, it wouldn't be as fun. I wouldn't be as interested or committed to doing it, um, to, to going back to those gardens. 
for a long time I thought, well, if I know what the end of the novel is, why would I write it? But it turns out things happen in the middle that are much more interesting. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thanks a lot.